Listen, do you struggle uh, with sharing the gospel? Uh, are you afraid to go out into your neighborhoods and tell people about Jesus? Uh, do you have this fear that just seems to overwhelm you? Well, listen, I want you to go and click our YouTube page, and I want you to know uh, where you can gain confidence. And where do we find confidence? We find confidence in the Word of God. and. Um, I'm a pastor. I've been doing this for a long time, and uh, people ask, "Well, so I wish I could go out and do this." But listen, that's why we created this YouTube page, so that we could disciple other people, and, and so that other people will be able to go out and reach their Jerusalem for Jesus Christ. Now, listen, what we'd love for you to do. Uh, you're going to see a subscribe button on the screen. We want you to click that and subscribe, so you can get more of our content. And uh, I want you to know this, and know this for sure. Know this, that Jesus loves you, He cares for you, and He's commissioned you to go share the good news. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, He has commissioned you to share the good news. If you would, please take your Bibles. Turn with me to James chapter 4. Five, James chapter 5. Listen, uh, according to an online source, there are 13 reasons, or maybe 12. I look at it and I said, man, this is more like 12 reasons uh, why growing up is hard. 12 reasons why growing up is hard. Now, in your own mind, what are those reasons? You probably have a lot going through your brain right now. Well, listen, I just thought it would be a tad entertaining. If I read you all 12 of these reasons. First, waking up for school was so much better than getting up for work. Uh, you miss your weekly pocket money. Buying things on your own is so expensive. <laughs> Getting groceries, paying bills, and maintaining your house are reasons enough to hate growing up. You're always expected to have your life together. <laughs> You end, up, you end up spending most of your time doing the things you hate the most, being an adult. Listen to this one. Relationships tend to be more complicated. Oh, I love number seven. Listen, one. you have to fake it so many times and be good to people you don't like. <laughs> Hey, listen, everything you do, people seem to judge. Oh, how about this one? I am now expected to feed myself. <laughs> here we go, here we go. Uh, this is number 10. If you have fun, people think you're just being childish. <laughs> Here's number 11. Your boss makes your life so hard. Teachers were so much better. <laughs> and they said number 12, 
One of the hardest things about growing up is the worst part is that you can never go back to being a kid. All right, now listen, I believe we can all admit that growing up is very difficult. Very, very difficult. However, there is a running theme that is unspoken throughout this very list. There's an unspoken theme. And that theme is patience. Patience. When growing up gets tough, we learn to be patient. In James chapter 5, 7 through 12, James addresses the suffering believers within the church. He is encouraging them to be patient. In today's message, we're going to discover how to be patient in suffering. How to be patient in suffering. And first, in order to have patience in suffering, we must anticipate suffering. So if you have your Bible, we're going to do James chapter 5. We're going to be in verses 7 through 12. And it says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmers wait for precious fruit of the earth, being patient, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed to remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. You have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Verse 12, But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by uh, uh, other oaths, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. As we said, that in order to have patience and suffering, James first tells us to anticipate suffering. First we see the command. James has already said in chapter 1, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you go through various trials and tribulations. In chapter 5, in verses 1 through 6, he has already called the rich to repentance. For their abuse of the poor. Now notice what James writes in verse 7. Notice what he says. Be patient therefore brothers. Until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits. For the precious fruit of the earth. Being patient about it. Until he receives the early and late rains. Listen in this verse we see the transition word. Therefore. Therefore. And we always when we see this word. We have to ask what is it there for. James goes from addressing the abuser to addressing the abused. He's transitioning from talking to one group of people to talking to a new group of people. Listen, notice the enduring term that he uses. He calls them brothers. Brothers. Why did he call him brothers? It was because he was empathizing with their pain. He was being compassionate towards them. Now notice the command James gives to his suffering friends. He tells them, be patient. See, the word patient means to get this. Wait, I don't, listen to this word. Wait, wait, wait. Listen. Remember, he's talking to suffering people. You know what this word patient means in the Greek? It's what it means in the Greek. To wait in tranquility. 
to wait in tranquility. In other words, James is saying, when something unjust takes place, have a long fuse. He's saying, chill out and don't blow your top. Wait in tranquility. Being patient is one of the most difficult things for any human being to accomplish. See, we live in a world of what? Instant gratification. We want it now. Our hearts are selfish. See, the patience that James is referring to does not come from our own human ability. James is referring to the fruit of the Spirit. He is talking about the supernatural patience that comes from the Holy Spirit. Only God can give you true patience in the midst of suffering. And just look at the life of Christ. Jesus demonstrated patience in suffering when going to the cross. Jesus was completely God and completely man. He willingly submitted to the suffering of the world. He prayed in the garden, listen, not my will, but yours be done. Listen, through the suffering of the cross, Jesus demonstrated for us the supernatural patience of God. Jesus suffered no longer than he should have. And he suffered no shorter than he should have. James is telling the oppressed in the church that their suffering would last no longer or no shorter than God would allow. He was reminding them of the strength and power of Christ to endure and persevere. He was giving them the command to be patient. But listen, he was telling them to be patient for the glory of God. He was telling them, be patient. Be patient for the Lord's sake. Be patient for His glory. After James gives the command to be patient, he gives an illustration of patience. And James continues in verses verses 7 through 9. He says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and late rains. Verse 8, You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another. Oh, wow. You can't. Were they Baptist? It says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. See, we see that James gives the illustration of a farmer. A farmer. Now, the name farmer in the scripture means husbandman. Now, what does that word husbandman mean? It means a plowman, a man of the soul, a tiller of the ground. Listen, a farmer is the perfect example of patience. Do crops pop up overnight? No. Do they have control over the weather? No. Listen, too much rain can destroy a crop and too little rain can destroy a crop. A farmer must demonstrate patience. If you want to dig a little more, look at what a Jewish farmer does. In Jewish culture, a a farmer would plow and sow in the fall of the months. The fall rain would soften the soil and spring rains or latter rains would come to mature the harvest. Why did the farmer wait so long for a result? He waited because he knew the fruit was needed. He knew the fruit was needed. It was necessary in order to survive. He knew that it would be worth the wait. Listen, in verse 8, James pictures Christians as spiritual farmers. Waiting on a spiritual harvest. 
Notice what he says in verse 8. He says, establish your hearts. Establish your hearts. See, in the Greek, this word also is translated to confirm. To confirm. It also derives from the root word meaning to cause to stand or to prop up. In Luke 9, 51, we read that Jesus set His face to go to Jerusalem. To set His face and to establish come from the same root word. Wow. Jesus established His heart towards the cross. Jesus established His heart towards His suffering. It was a term used to show courage and commitment in the midst of trial. James was encouraging his audience not to collapse under the weight of persecution. He wanted them to set their face on the return of Jesus Christ. He was reminding them that their suffering was temporary. He wanted the oppressed people in the church to keep their eyes on the prize. In verse 8 of chapter 5, James is referring to believers' personal responsibilities of spiritual strengthening. So on, we see the anticipate, we see the command, we see the illustration. Now let's look at the application. In this text, we see the, com- uh, the combination of divine providence and human responsibility. Divine providence and human responsibility. Listen, Christians are not to let go and let God. How many times have you heard that statement? Just let go and let God. Maybe you've made it yourself. Christians are not to let go and let God, nor is it to be a legalistic self-effort. A true believer is to live as if everything depends on them, knowing that all depends on God. When going through suffering, we need to stay in God's Word. There are spiritual disciplines, my friends, that we are responsible for. We are to get in the Word every day. We are to pray every day. We are to seek the Lord every day. But my friends, we can't do it without Him. We need to realize that God will finish the work that He has started in us. Philippians 1.6 And I am sure of this, that he, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. My friends, remember that God is bringing forth the harvest in our own lives. You can only enjoy the harvest only if your heart is established. Only if your heart is established. The farmer does not stand around doing nothing. The farmer is always busy. He always has challenges. He is always working. He does not fight with his neighbors. But instead, most farmers are known to help one another. This might have been what James had in mind in verse 9. When he says, do not grumble against one another. Brothers, he uses that endearing term again. So that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Listen, impatience with God often leads to impatience with with others. Impatience with God often leads to impatience with others. James was telling the suffering people in the church not to grumble against one another. He was saying that times are tough, but don't complain. Tongues are tough, but don't complain. James tells believers not to complain so that they may not be judged. My friends, every believer will one day stand before the Lord and He will judge our works on this earth. 
James was telling the oppressed believers within the church not to complain in their suffering, but to be patient in their suffering. Be patient. In order to have patience in suffering, not only are we to anticipate suffering, but we are to analyze our suffering. Notice in verse 10, James gives us an illustration of suffering to analyze. An example of suffering and patient brothers take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. See, James used the example of who? The prophets. The prophets were what they were God's spokesmen. All through the Old Testament, we see God's prophets persecuted. <laughs> Moses had to put up with stiff-necked, rebellious Israelites who left Israel. David was hunted by King, uh, by King Saul. Elijah faced hostility from King Ahab and Jezebel. Jeremiah, my friends, was known as the weeping prophet because of his suffering. Ezekiel endured the death of his wife. Daniel was torn from his homeland and thrown into a lion's den for his faithfulness to God. Listen, Hosea endured a heartbreaking marriage. When we read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus used the prophets as an example of victory over persecution. These were men who preached, what? In the name of the Lord. These were men in the will of God. These were people who were doing what God had called them to do. And they suffered. They suffered. There is a belief among Christians that suffering is a result of sin or unfaithfulness. Oh, you just don't have enough faith. The reason you're suffering, the reason you're going through persecution, the reason things are going bad in your life is because you are not being faithful to God. You know, to some extent, that might hold some truth. But listen to me, listen to me. It's not your faith that keeps you. It is the faith of a holy God that keeps you firmly grasped in the palm of His hand. I guess you could say that most Christians in our culture have adopted a karma culture. A karma mentality. What goes on, what goes around, comes around. However, this type of thinking goes completely against the teaching of the Scripture. Yes, we serve a God that will not be mocked and He will judge sin and disobe disobedience. But before we jump, uh, jump down the rabbit hole of, of karma, we need to remember that suffering always comes because of faithfulness. Suffering always comes because of faithfulness. 2 Timothy 3.12 says this, Indeed, all who deserve to live godly life in Christ will be persecuted. That's so good. Let's read it again. 2 Timothy 3.12 Indeed, all who deserve to live a godly life in Christ, in Christ Jesus, will be persecuted. So much for your best life now. <laughs> My friends, we need to remember that following Jesus does not mean that we will live a life of ease and pleasure. All we need to do is look at Jesus he was completely obedient and it led him to the cross. It led him to suffering. The patience that the prophets exhibited in their suffering should provide encouragement for us, my friends. It should, it should provide encouragement for believers to run the race with diligence and with faithfulness. Now that we have analyzed the illustration of the prophets, let us now analyze the application of the prophets. Verse 10, James uses the word suffering. Suffering. Now, 
Pay attention. Here is a Greek definition of the word suffering. A Greek definition of the word suffering. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. This is a long definition. At least for, you know, it's not just a one word or a couple, uh, a sentence or so. It's, it's kind of a long definition for, at least I think it is. So the Greek definition of this word means to experience affliction that seems bad, miserable. From an earthly perspective, but in actuality, it is sent by God to accomplish His greater purpose. It's a great definition, isn't it? See, the prophets understood that suffering was ordained by God. Suffering is ordained by God. They understood that God does not waste pain. If God ordained for His own Son to suffer, if God ordained for His own Son to suffer, then my friends, what makes this any different? I will say this, not everyone will have to die a martyr's death. Suffering will come in all forms. None of us here are exempt. We're all going to suffer. Some way, fashion, or form. If you're a true believer in Christ Jesus, you will suffer for the cause of Christ. And why does He allow suffering? Why does He allow it? God allows suffering into our lives so that we look more like Jesus. He uses it to sanctify us. He uses it as His instrument, as His hands to mold this human clay. 1 Peter 2, 19-20 says this, for this is commendable if because of consciousness, conscious toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Let's read that again. For this is commendable if because of conscious toward, uh, toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take, a, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow His steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Listen, suffering is the instrument that God uses to bring us to our knees. It causes the believer to be drawn to God's Word and to God's people. Suffering builds up our faith. It helps us see who God is. It. Not only does James mention suffering, but he also mentions patience once again. Listen, this is the same word that we've already mentioned. It means to wait in tranquility. However, in verse 10, the word patient has a more personal approach. It is referring to patience with people. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. Really am. People are difficult. <laughs> We're depraved. We're messed up. We're sinners. I'm going to people are difficult. But what 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 
What James is saying to the church, he said, people are difficult in your life, but be patient. Be patient. Listen, God gives us patience toward the ones who are hurting us. He gives us the strength to endure. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says this. More than that, we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces what? Endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Oh, let's read Romans 8.11 while we add it. And it also tells us, Romans 8.11 tells us that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead what lives in us. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, because Christ lives in us, we can learn to be patient toward those who persecute us. We can learn to be patient with people. Not only are we to anticipate suffering, analyze suffering. Here comes the real tough one. We are to appreciate suffering. We are to appreciate suffering. Notice the illustration that he gives. In verse 11, James writes, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Listen, in this verse, James is addressing what the church as a whole. He is now going from addressing uh, the abuser, the abused. Now he's talking to everyone. He says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. Listen, in this verse, James is addressing everyone. He is reminding the church of the blessing that comes from suffering. He was saying rich people are going to suffer. Poor people are going to suffer. Everyone is going to suffer. To some degree. Listen, if there were never any battles, there would never be there would, there would never be victories. We will never fully know the goodness of God unless we learn to endure suffering. So I love this quote by John MacArthur. It says, God's blessing does not come to people who do great things, but to pe- but to people who endure. These are the people who will receive the greatest blessing of life. Have you ever noticed that those who have endured suffering the most have the most zest for life? In verse 11, James gives us an illustration of such a man. He tells us of the endurance of Job. He was an individual that endured unimaginable, unexplained suffering. He endured direct attack from Satan himself. He lost his children. He lost lost all his wealth. He lost his health. He lost his status in society. He even lost the sense of God's presence. He he had so-called friends that did nothing but accuse him and made him doubt God. He was a man that was confused in the midst of pain and suffering. However, throughout the story of Job, we never see him blame God. He came close. (laughs) But he never blamed God. Job said, though he slay me, listen this, though he slay me, I will hope in him. I will hope in him. Now that we have seen the illustration of appreciating suffering, we will now look at the application of appreciating suffering. In verse 11, James says, you have seen the purpose of the Lord. See, the purpose of suffering is to demonstrate the glory of the Lord in our lives. The purpose of the Lord's dealing with Job provides hope for all who are patiently endure suffering. Suffering. 
The example of Job encourages those suffering trials to patiently endure, realizing the Lord's purpose is to strengthen them, perfect them, and in the end to richly bless them. See, the true blessings of Job was not that God restored all that was taken to him, but that he got to know the creator of the universe in the midst of suffering. My friends, this is the purpose of our suffering. We get to know God. Part of appreciating suffering is getting to know the character of God. Look at verse 11. It says that God is compassionate and merciful. Some translate compassionate as full of compassion. However, the Greek word literally means, hold on, you're going to love this. Love it, you're going to love it. It means many bowed. Many bowed. I remember years ago uh, watching a Mark Lowry video. And it stuck with me. He says a lot of crazy things, but what he said one time was very accurate. A lot of times when we think about the seed of our emotions, we say, man, my heart is broken. Why? Why? We say we, Jesus comes into our hearts. Well, does Jesus really come into our blood pumping vessel? No, it's talking about the city, the seed of who we are, the emotion of who we are, the very depths of who we are. You see, in Jewish culture, when they talked about the seed of the emotions, he was talking about being many bowed. It's talking about the center, the gut of who you are. Mm -hmm. He talked about compassion. Some say that this particular word might have been coined by James himself. Because the term full of compassion or many bowed, this is the only time we ever see this word used in the Scripture. He said, you're suffering, uh, getting to know God, knowing who He is. You get to know Him intimately to your very gut of who you are. In other words, He, he is a God that sympathizes enormously with our pain. To say that God is many bowed is to affirm that He has an enormous capacity of compassion. In the Old Testament, King David wrote about the great compassion of God. <clears throat> Psalms 103.8 The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding instead fast love. David goes on to discuss some of the riches of God's grace and compassion and points out the paternal nature of the Lord. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on his loyal followers. For he knows that we are made of, he realizes we are made of clay. Not only does James mention the character of God's compassion, but he mentions the character of God's mercy. God's mercy is taught throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because God is merciful and cares for us, we can cast our anxiety on Him. Listen, James is reassuring the suffering people within the church that God will give them merciful and compassionate response. James is telling the church that by anticipating the Lord's return, by recognizing the Lord's judgment, by following the example of the prophets, by understanding God's purpose and His character, trials can be patiently endured. 
My friends, may our words become like the psalmist, for his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Oh, listen, church, this is what it means to appreciate suffering. This is what it means to appreciate suffering. Lastly, we see this. We see the administration of suffering. The administration of suffering. In verse 12, James writes, But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let our yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Now, some of you may ask, what does this statement have to do with suffering? It seems to be kind of blown out into proportion. It seems to be kind of odd after he has this long structure of things. And then boom, he puts verse 12 and he says, Listen, I don't want you to swear any oaths to people. I don't want you to swear. What what does he mean? In the midst of suffering, our emotions can be highly charged. And therefore, it is easy to say things we don't mean. What does it mean? It means that we are to watch our mouths in the midst of suffering. It means we are to watch what we say. We are to watch how we behave in the midst of our suffering. See, the Jews were famous The Jews were were famous for, for, for taking oaths. Listen, throughout the Old Testament, we see God's people say we are done worshiping false gods. However, look back at their history. What do we see? What do we see back in Jewish history? We see they kept on returning over and over and over again to false gods and to false idols. Why? They had taken oaths. They had made promises. But they were empty. And they didn't last. When life began to get easier, they went back to their own pagan idol worship. James commanded not to swear. Seems to be reminding believers of the Sermon on the Mount. What did Jesus say? And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. James was telling the church not to put words in the mouth of God. How many times you say, oh God wants me to do this. How many times you've heard that? Or, my, or my, here's my favorite. One. Hear this one. Hear this one too. All the time. And I love, I love my reformed brothers. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. But this is what I hear all the time. It's the sovereignty of God. Be careful when you put words in God's mouth. Be careful about doing that. Because that's nothing more than swearing an oath. And it can mock his character and who he is. James is telling the church not to put words in the mouth of God. Listen, God is in control, not us. We are not to use God as our personal genie or use the name as a way to manipulate others. Now that we have seen the command, let us examine the application real quick. James tells the church to let your yes be yes and your no be no. James is telling believers that in the midst of suffering to use few words. As believers, all we have to say is yes and no. In verse 12, James is once again separating the true believer from the false believer. At the end of this, James says, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Those who are true believers will repent of their words and actions, but those who do not will never be saved with it and will fall under condemnation. 
If the Holy Spirit is alive in you, He will not only give you patience in your actions, but He will give you the ability to be patient in your speech. Listen, James is reinforcing what he said in chapter 1. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. To James, today James has told us how to have patience and suffer. Now, here, here's the question this morning. How are you doing? Are you suffering this morning? Are you struggling with being patient in your suffering? What are the things that are challenging to you today? What are the things that are challenging to you this morning? What was challenging to you yesterday? Who are the people in your life that are trying your patience? Who are these people? Who are they? Listen, God has given us the perfect example of being patient and suffering through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus knew our sinful situation and focused on His mission. Oh, my friends, listen to me. Jesus knew His sinful situation and focused on His mission. He knew that He was going to die for sinful people. He knew that He was going to carry the weight of the world on the cross. But He never forsook His mission. My friends, we're not to forsake our mission. We're to keep our eyes on Him. James did not foc- uh, Jesus did not focus on Himself, but came as a humble servant. He didn't sit back and say, look at my situation. Look how bad it is. Oh, look at this. Look at what I'm going to do. I came to suffer for you. He did not do that. He came as a humble servant. He came as a person who came to, to wash feet. Jesus did not complain during His suffering. Jesus focused on the glory of God. Jesus was patient in His suffering for my sake and for your sake. He knew that suffering would lead to redemption. Listen, oh my friends, be patient. Be patient. You've heard it said before, if you pray for patience, God's going to give you something patient. To make, he'll give you something in your life to make you patient. I was going to go ahead and tell you, you know, I, I wish it was a dog and a cat that would teach you patience or maybe an animal that would teach you patience. Because I'm going to tell you why they don't talk back. <laughs> God sends people. Persecution comes through people and God gives his patience to deal with people for his glory let's go to the Lord in prayer Heavenly Father Lord we come before you I want to thank you for joining us today at Rekindled Church And we want to get to know you more, all right? We're going to have some contact information at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to Facebook us. You can email me personally at wilsonmore at rekindledchurch.com. We would love to be able to hear from you. We want to be able to pray with you. Let us know how we can serve you in any way. But most importantly, I want you to know this. I want you to know that Jesus loves you, and I do too.